you know, it's okay to be white. Like, I don't know where white people got this idea that it wasn't because, I mean, y'all have the privilege. Today, I want to address a topic I find fascinating. The recent trend of fetishization of racially ambiguous women and or exotic features. According to Google, racial ambiguity is a term used to describe someone whose racial background is unclear at first glance. It's often been forced onto mixed race and other racialized people who happen to have lighter skin. One of the major bases for race and ethnicity is appearance, and while there is obviously a spectrum of typical features within a given race, there are dominant relative features that help define what an average person of this race would look like. White people have a lighter skin complexion and usually lighter hair color. Black people have dark skin and tight, dark curly hair. East Asian people have dark, straight hair and often have monolids, etc. Through history and still very much so today, in Western countries, the most desirable traits have mostly been Eurocentric in nature. By Eurocentric, we are talking about white pale skin, blonde hair, blue eyes, slim figure, etc. This remains true for people of color that live in those Western countries as well. And those beauty standards have also been exported across the globe through colonization and later on globalization. We've all heard of Asian people getting double eyelid surgery or darker skinned people bleaching their skin. What's interesting is that despite that, there is an emerging trend of white people trying to emulate ethnic features now deemed desirable through plastic surgery or makeup or semi-permanent alterations. You've probably heard of blackfishing where celebrities and other people have been accused of trying to appear black and borrowing black features or alternatively perpetrating cultural appropriation. The Kardashians and Ariana Grande have all notably been heavily criticized for doing so. The Kardashians, as I've noted and so many other people have noted, have surrounded themselves with black people for as long as we can all remember. But the rest of them have really, really surrounded themselves with black people as a means of gaining access into blackness in a way that they would not otherwise. And I think their relationships, those relationships have given them access or they think it has given them leeway to participate in blackness in ways that are, you know, completely unacceptable. And I think that the Kardashians conveniently situate themselves within that sort of gray area and that liminal space of race so that they can't fully be called out one way or the other. They're benefiting off of the ambiguity of their, you know, making themselves more brown, literally, and then their situatedness around Black people for the most part. I think that before going further, it's important to note that beauty is highly valued in our society. There's a certain level of privilege that is afforded to people who are considered beautiful by our societal standards. Pretty privilege works on the principle that people who are deemed more attractive based on societal beauty standards have an upper hand in the world and are afforded many opportunities that us regular folks don't have. And since beauty is heavily commodified and an industry worth over $500 billion, according to Forbes.com, it's not surprising that there's a market capitalizing on the growing popularity of specific ethnically desirable traits. I also want to note that I have a personal vested interest in this topic since I am partially mixed myself and I have a son and am currently pregnant with a daughter that will be even more mixed because um, their dad is Asian. So first let's discuss traditional Eurocentric beauty standards for a little bit of context. If you would rather skip this section, there will be timestamps in the video bar and in the description box. It's easy to imagine that through history, European imperialism and colonialism were responsible for widespreading Western beauty ideals. By promoting whiteness and its defining features such as very light skin, straight blonde hair, blue eyes, Nordic facial features, thin bodies, etc., colonizers were reinforcing the idea of European superiority and the oppression of the ones who could not conform to those standards. And also, I mean, when you have like racial theorists like Christoph Miners and, and Johann Blumenbach, when you have racial theorists like that believing to the cores of their white supremacist bones that the Caucasians were the most beautiful race, I don't know, it just makes sense that most white folks would internalize that and help spread that mentality to marginalized groups. 
And that struggle to like decolonize your mind is something I think a lot of people of color struggle with. More recently, the global dominance of American media and entertainment, the rise of social media and the subsequent westernization of cultures in the rest of the world has also been contributing to the popularization of Eurocentric beauty standards. Since most of these media feature predominantly white folks, it's easy to understand why European features are considered the beauty ideal. This has led to a rise in cosmetic surgery aimed at emulating Western beauty standards, particularly in Asia. Korea has often been referred to as the capital of cosmetic surgery of the world, with Japan not far behind. In Korea, nearly 50% of women in their 20s undergo double eyelid surgery. A research paper from the International Socioeconomics Laboratory explored in detail the specific beauty standard influencing different parts of Asia. For instance, in Central Asia and parts of the Middle East, young women are influenced to consider skin whitening, double eyelid surgery, and blepharoplasty, a surgery aimed at droopy eyelids. In South Asia, lighter skin has been associated with symbolic cultural capital such as upper class image, luxury prestige, and success. In East Asia, double eyelid surgery is very popular and lighter skin tones are preferred. Of course, this is a bit reductionist and isn't 100% due to the spread of Eurocentric beauty standards. A lot of other historic influences are at play, but for the sake of this conversation, I believe these still remain relevant. The desirability of light skin stretches through a lot of cultures. Historically, in many cultures such as ancient Chinese, Japanese, Egyptian, Greek, and Roman societies, lighter skin was associated with aristocracy and higher class, whereas darker skin usually meant one was often a peasant and worked outside all day. Similarly, during slavery in the United States, darker skin usually meant one worked in the fields, and lighter skin usually meant they worked in the homes, a more favorable environment. For Latinx, European genes and looks seem to be more valued in American households, although I couldn't find much information on the actual beauty standards of respective cultures. In her article for Medium.com, Charlotte F. recounts her own experience as a light-skinned Latina, saying that whiteness was highly valued in her family and how she didn't experience as much racism, insecurities, and consequence low self-esteem her own mother felt as a brown-skinned Latina in America. She also mentions that a recent Pew Research Center survey found that the darker a Latin person's skin is, the more likely they were to experience discrimination. In fact, nearly two-thirds of Latinx with darker skin report experiencing discrimination or being treated unfairly from time to time. That's compared to half of those with lighter skin tone. The recent rise in mixed raceness is most likely due to the evolving demographics in the United States. According to a Pew Research Center analysis of Census Bureau data, one in seven or 14% of U.S. infants were multiracial or multi ethnic in 2015, which is nearly triple the share in 1980. There's also been an exponential rise in popularity of black culture in the last few decades, and especially even more since the renewed momentum of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020. There has also been growing trends of racial inclusivities in film and televisions in the recent years, although I couldn't find concrete statistic data to support this claim. BIPOC artists and influencers are also gaining popularity across all social media platforms. In my research, I came across an article from Duke University talking about the perception of multiracialness. It said just the suggestion that an African American person is of mixed race heritage makes that person more attractive to others. This holds true even if the people in question aren't actually of multiracial heritage. According to the peer reviewed study published in the June 2016 issue of Review of Black Political Economy. The simple perception of exoticism sways people to see multiracial blacks as better looking, um, says the author Robert L. Rees, a doctoral candidate in sociology at Duke. Being exotic is a compelling idea, Rees says, so people are attracted to a certain type of difference. So that brings us to this new trend of people trying to imitate typically black features. According to Urban Dictionary, the term blackfishing is defined as commonly perpetrated by female of European descent, white, which involves artificial tanning and using makeup to manipulate facial features in order to appear to have some type of black African ancestry. The general point of black fishing is to appear African, Arab, or Hispanic ancestry. The term seems to have been popularized in 2018 by journalist Juana Thompson on a viral Twitter thread discussing how white celebrities and influencers cosplay as black women on social media. The appropriation of black culture has existed long before that through the copying of traditionally black hairstyles such as braids, cornrows, 
perms, dreadlocks, etc., and fashion, among other ways. There are obviously extreme examples of this, like Martina Big or Rachel Dalzwell, but celebrities often called out for milder forms of blackfishing include Kim Kardashian, Ariana Grande, Rita Ora, and Jesse Nelson from Little Mix. Many influencers have also been accused of this distasteful behavior, notably Emma Hallberg and Micah Francis. Do you believe the reason why Kim K and her family were able to penetrate the way they did was because they started to associate themselves with black people. They started to look biracial. They're picking and choosing parts of black women and parts of blackness to put on and to try on as costumes. And then they will discard them whenever it suits them. So lips are one of the things, their skin color, um, a lot of the time their hairstyles, people they associate with, and then the shapes of their bodies, right? As her music has evolved, so is her, her persona. And she's definitely changed a lot. And she's moved towards a more um, urban style <laughs> or urban music style. Um, it's not like she just changed up her music style. She changed everything. She changed her skin tone. She changed her lyrics. She changed her speaking voice even. Hey pop star, it's Ariana. And I would have to say a summer beauty tip. That hair, when was that? I'm like, bitch, that's my cookie. It's my juice, okay? I mean, the fact that her skin tone was the same complexion as Nicki Minaj is a little disconcerting. Not gonna lie. What is important to denote is that a big criticism echoed by many black people is that there is a certain unfair convenience white people have to be able to take what they want from another race or ethnicity's culture and adopt it without facing real life consequences and harsh disadvantages that people of color actually face on a daily basis. On BBC Radio's Four Women's Hour, journalist Juana Thompson even suggested that that people will adopt typical black beauty traits just enough to hang on to racial ambiguity without fully dealing with the consequences of blackness. She also says that black women are constantly bombarded with the promotion of European beauty standards in the media. So when their likeness is then embraced on women who have the privilege to fit traditional standards, yet fully co-op blackness to their liking, it reaffirms the belief that people desire blackness, just not black women. I know that these women are not trying to be black like me. They want to be either exotic white, a la the Kardashians, or they want to be mixed race, like the Kardashian offspring. So we've seen some of the different ways white people have been altering their image to adopt some racially ambiguous traits before, like excessive tanning, texturizing and coloring of the hair, and some more dramatic measures such as cosmetic surgery, including the recent rise of popularity of BBLs or Brazilian butt lifts and fox eye surgeries. For the sake of clarity, I define semi-permanent alteration as temporary specific treatments and cosmetic applications that last longer than a day's wear and often cannot be removed easily. Examples include self-tanning, but also eyelash extensions, artificial nails, microblading or laminating of the eyebrows, permanent makeup, eyeliner, lip shading, etc., hair coloration and texturization, hair extensions, and even body hair removal. Can we take a moment to look at the extremely disturbing amount of procedures, even impermanent ones, we are being marketed to as women? Also, how crazy is it that we are commodifying so much of our looks? I should probably make a video on that someday. Now, obviously, any surgery, even minor ones, comes with its own risk, uh, but those semi-permanent alterations are typically mostly harmless. Some of them do expose you to certain chemicals, so they should still be used with caution. Um, I should also mention that some image editing apps and filters allow you to edit your pictures to look more tanned or change the shape of your eyes, amongst other things. That's also another way to temporarily imitate certain ethnic features. I want to expand on tanning just for a moment because I was watching one of Salem Tover's video and I actually realized something that I never really considered before, or she made me consider it. Tanning is just as problematic as bleaching your skin. I said it and I don't regret it. It is problematic and that's that. Why is bleaching your skin problematic but not tanning? Can someone explain? Can someone share with the class? Can someone raise their hand? Yes, you in the back. Wake up. Both are toxic to the skin and both are changing who you are and the skin you were born with. She's not wrong. Especially if we're talking about tanning beds, we all know by now that 
they are linked with high risk of developing skin cancer. But what I recently learned is actually that spray tans may also be particularly bad for your health. Spray tans are a whole other beast because we're talking about DHA applied onto one organ, the skin. Now, what happens when you inhale DHA and it affects another organ like your lungs? And this is where it can get dangerous. And the FDA has warned against the use of spray tanning booths, especially in people who work in these salons because they're doing like 10, 15, 20, 30 treatments a day and who knows how much they're inhaling. So copious amounts of DHA, what you have to be careful with because it can affect your lungs and it can lead to lung toxicity over time. And we don't know what other sort of side effects. I encourage you to watch the rest of the video if you would like to learn more about self-tanning. It'll be linked in the description box below. Lastly, I thought it was important to touch on colorism within communities of colors and in media. The National Con Conference for Community and Justice, NCCJ, defines colorism as the pra a practice of discrimination by which those with lighter skin are treated more favorably than those with darker skin. This practice is a product of racism in the United States in that it upholds the white standards of beauty and benefits white people in the institution of oppression, media, medical world, etc. In a Teen Vogue article, Tiffany Onyejiaka, I uh, hope I said it right, the author blames Hollywood producers and casting agents for not including more dark skinned black women in roles made for them. They choose to endorse an incredibly narrow selection of black women, yet at the same time want to get accolades for achieving diversity and representation on screen. This lack of representation is the reason why some of the most popular black actresses that book so many roles are light-skinned, like Zendaya, Halle Berry, Zoe Saldana, and Amanda Stenberg, to name a few. She adds that it indicates that Hollywood still overwhelmingly believe that a black woman must possess non-black ancestry or features to be considered beautiful or valuable. Interestingly, there is also this trend I have noticed for Hollywood to cast often half Asian to play Asian roles. There's definitely been a lot of famous half Asian actresses and celebrities like Vanessa Hudgens, Chrissy Teigen, Shay Mitchell, Kristen Kruk, Janelle Parrish, and Maggie Q, and a growing list of half Asian heartthrobs like Charles Melton, Darren Barnett, and Ross Butler, just to name a few. Time for some final thoughts. I think the rise in popularity of racial ambiguity as an aesthetic is definitely a fascinating phenomenon, and I'm interested to see where it goes. I don't think it's going to replace the age-old Eurocentric beauty standards, which are still very much alive and well. But with the shift in demographics in Western countries and more and more actually mixed people being born, it'll be interesting to see what societal beauty standards will evolve into. Maybe as the rest of the world continues to westernize and beauty standards in other countries continue to be influenced by the dominant American culture, we'll see white people trying to look a little bit more ethnic and ethnic people trying to look more white until we kind of all look different from our birth, race, or ethnicity. Who knows? I'm interested to see what you think. In regards to blackfishing and the different alterations people make to adopt popularized ethnic beauty traits, I think it's important to note that most of those people aren't malintentioned. In her video, It's Okay to Be White, which I have featured a couple times in this video, Madison Brown actually says that she believes this type of behavior shows a person's insecurity more than their insensitivity, and I would have to agree with that. Yes, people should be more self-aware of the sources of their influences and how it affects other people, but most girls who excessively tan or wear braids are not intentionally trying to rip off black culture, and I don't think even most of them are intentionally trying to look black or exotic. I think most of them are just following the trends like any other trend. Speaking of mostly Western countries, in the 2000s, being skinny and blonde was cool, and now the hourglass shape and being tanned are deemed cooler. I think it might have something to do with the idea that maybe if you're tan, it means that you're wealthy enough to go on vacation and spend leisure time outside. Oh, how the times have changed. Remember how historically people who spend time outside used to be of lower social caste? Interesting. <laughs> to end on a more personal note, I want to examine my own experiences and involvement with this trend. Living in Canada and getting so little sunlight for over half the year, my skin naturally fluctuates a lot between seasons. In the winter, I look like this, <laughs> pretty much. Um, and in the summer, I can actually look like this. Um, it's kind of interesting actually because in the winter I usually pass for white pretty easily but in the summer I look more mixed and my Latina sides like pops 
a little bit more. I also want to take a second to acknowledge that I am guilty of going to tanning salons in my teen, however horrible that is, and even editing a bit of tan onto my pictures because of self-consciousness. So I'm definitely not without fault and I have to accept my responsibility in sometimes chasing that look. I think this wraps up this video. It's my first scripted well-researched essay. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think and I will see you soon with more videos. Thank you for watching.